Okay, everyone, a little extra on the abdomen. I just thought of another benefit of recording these. Now you can't be like newly man and throwing things at me after the exam. Well, okay, so the abdomen. This is the part of the body between the thorax and the pelvis. Okay, so we already did thorax, we're going to do pelvis. This is a section in between. It has muscular tendinous walls, except posteriorly where the wall is actually the lumbar vertebrae and the discs. The abdominal wall encloses the abdominal cavity, which contains the peritoneal cavity, and houses most of the organs of digestion and parts of the urogenital system. So a little bit about the anterior lateral abdominal wall because it's kind of important stuff and, and you do end up palpating this a lot and treating it. Um, so it's bounded superiorly by the cartilage of the 7th and through 10th ribs, the xiphoid process, and inferiorly by the inguinal ligament, which we'll talk about today, and the pelvic bones. Um, the anterior lateral abdominal wall consists of skin, subcutaneous tissue, which is all that yellow stuff we love seeing in lab, and muscles, and their aponeurosis. There's a lot of aponeurosis in the thoracic wall. Deep fascia, extra peritoneal fat, and parietal peritoneum. So if we look here on the right, this is typically what you see. And these are the levels of the abdominal wall, right? So you have your skin out here, then you have this layer of subcutaneous fat, the yellow stuff, and then you have muscular layers. You have your external oblique, your internal oblique, and your transverse abdominis, and then you have another layer of extra peritoneal flat fat. The extra peritoneal means it's outside the peritoneal cavity itself, okay? And then this thin black layer here is actually your parietal peritoneum which is similar to the pleural peritoneum that we talked about. It's sort of the envelope of the, of the abdomen. On the left here, what I want you to see mainly is the greater omentum, right? All this yellow stuff here is the greater omentum. And it's tough to describe, but you'll certainly see it and know it when you, when you see it in lab. It's a sort of like a big slab of what looks like fat, but it is subcutaneous tissue and it covers the contents of the abdominal cavity. There's a greater omentum and a lesser omentum, but um, this is the greater omentum, obviously a much larger structure. So the skin of the abdominal wall adheres loosely to the subcutaneous tissue, except at the umbilicus, where it actually invaginates in, and it's the attachment for your what was your umbilical cord that carried oxygenated blood to the fetus and deoxygenated blood away from it. So you'll see on the cadavers, well, we've already sort of removed the skin, so you won't see it, but if you look closely at the umbilicus on some of the cadavers, you'll see that the skin adhered very closely to there and actually invaginated into the abdominal wall at that point. Four pairs of muscles of the anterior lateral abdominal wall. These are your external oblique, your internal oblique, transverse abdominal muscle, and the rectus abdominis. So this is where you start coming into a lot of um, aponeurosis here is when you start looking at these muscles. The fibers of the external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominal muscle travel from their origins, sort of lateral on the thorax, medially towards the abdomen. Their fibers actually become tendinous. So they transition from that red muscle that we see on the cadavers to this white fascial sheath um, that you'll see. So there's a very broad aponeurosis in the anterior part of your abdomen and it's all the muscles converging into this sheath together. So it's there is a site in the midline of the abdomen where the fibers of these three muscles come together and it causes a real thickening of this rectus sheath and that is called the linea alba. So it's right in the center of your abdomen, right here in the center of your abdomen, right? So here are your obliques, your external obliques, internal is underneath, transverse abdominal is underneath. And they all transition right here into this white fascial system. And this white fascial system is the aponeurosis. That's what we call the aponeurosis. And so this aponeurosis is what helps make your six pack. Because right? you can see the lines. The linea alba is the center line, and then there are invaginations of fascia that form these other little pockets of abdominals. Okay, but your linea alba is the center of this fascia system. So this fascia, this would be the greater omentum here, and the fascial systems underneath that greater omentum, the aponeurosis. Okay, first muscle, the external oblique. 
largest and most superficial of the three fat, flat muscles. Um, it arises from the external surface of ribs 5 through 12 and attaches right into that rectal sheath, eventually into the linea alba, and actually goes on to the front of the iliac crest a bit too. Most of its fibers run inferior medially from the most anterior and superior fibers approaching a nearly horizontal course. Um, you'll see this. there's a lot of variability of that on, on cadavers, though, of how uh, horizontal they end up being. Primary function is they function with the um, internal obliques for, to cause um, flexion of the trunk and rotation of the trunk, and side bending of the trunk mostly. But we'll get into that a little bit more. And then you have your internal oblique down here. Right? So you can see they're sort of running in the opposite direction of the fibers of your external oblique. They're deep to the external oblique. So your ex externals are on top of your internals. These fibers run perpendicular to the external uh, in a superior medial direction. You'll notice that it originates all along the iliac crest and runs right up and again attaches into your bottom ribs and into that aponeurosis, an anterior aponeurosis. So at the linea alba, that line that we talked about in the middle of the aponeurosis, most of the fibers of the external cross with fibers of the internal oblique and become continuous with each other. So they sort of meld in, into one there. They become very difficult to differentiate. So because of this blending, the internal and external obliques form a two-bellied muscle that shares a common tendon. Therefore, they actually work together as a unit, the internal and external obliques, to laterally flex and rotate the trunk. Okay, So to bring your left shoulder to the right hip, so if you were curling up and bring your left shoulder to the right hip, what would actually be doing that would be your left external oblique and your right internal oblique. So it's not the internal and external on the same side working together. It's the external on one side and the internal on the other side that work together to cause that trunk rotation. Okay, it's a little difficult to conceptualize, but you kind of just have to learn it. If you think about fiber directions, it begins to make sense. All right, so this is just showing you, this is your rectus abdominis right here in the middle, right? And here is your internal, your transverse abdominis, internal oblique and external oblique, and they each have their own little fascial systems here, or aponeurosis. But if you notice, around here, they all form. Right, these, these two aponeurosis come in and form into a single one here. And same thing posteriorly, to come in and around um, the rectus abdominis. And then you've got your fat layer on top, and you've got your peritoneum back here, and your extra peritoneal fascia, which means it's outside the peritoneum cavity. Okay, your transverse abdominal muscle, really these fibers run very horizontal. They are under your internal obliques, so third layer of abdominal muscles. They're the deepest of the three flat muscles. Uh, again, they run horizontally or transversely. And their primary function, that because of how transversely they run, is to sort of suck in your abdomen and provide compression, and that helps change uh, intra-abdominal pressure by providing that compression. And then you have your rectus abdominis. This is a more broad uh, strap-like muscle, runs vertically. The left and right muscles are separated from, by that linea alba. Three or more tendinous insertions anchor the muscles to the rectus sheath transversely. And um, those rectal sheaths are what cause your six-pack, as we already said. Right? So your rectus abdominis is running all the way from sternum down to your pubic, down to your pubic bone. Right? It runs the whole length of your abdomen. Okay, three muscles now, they that are paired, there's one on each side, and they're, they're considered uh, abdominal muscles, although their function is often at the hip, but they're in the abdominal cavity, so we're going to consider them here. Okay, your first one is your quadratus lumborum. Right, quadratus lumborum um, runs to the medial half of the inferior border of the 12th rib, down to the iliac crest, and its primary function is to extend and laterally flex the vertebral column. So it's a lateral flexor of the spine. Okay, so it doesn't, the other function it has is it can elevate this part of the pelvis as well. So if you fix this end by holding your, your ribs stable, you can use the quadratus lumborum to elevate the pelvis as well. 
the ilia on that side. The other ones you have here is your iliacus, right? And this runs inside the pelvis from the iliac crest down to the uh, lesser trochanter on the femur. Okay, so this is um, this muscle is um, a hip flexor. It works a hip flexor hip. Okay, sorry, headphone call. Quick to figure out how to turn my phone off. Um, okay, so you had your iliacus here, serves as a hip flexor. And then you have your psoas major, which is this big, thick one, and then the psoas minor here. You mostly talk about them as a single muscle, I have to say. Um, don't talk about the psoas minor as being separate from the major. Uh, but the psoas major is your primary hip flexor. It runs from the transverse process of your lumbar vertebrae, sides of the bodies of T12, L4 and discs between them to the lesser trochanter of the femur. So it works with your iliacus to form the iliopsoas muscle and is the major hip flexor. Sorry, let me get back to this. Okay, so I've said we talked about the iliopsoas and the Iliacus becoming, you'll often hear it talked of as an iliopsoas muscle. Uh, they combine because they work together to flex the hip. Okay, so here is your psoas, right? Comes from your vertebral bodies um, and the intervertebral discs down to the lesser trochanter. And your iliacus comes from inside your iliac crest down to the lesser trochanter. So, very important to think of the implications of these uh, in origins of the psoas major on your lumbar spine. Because if someone has too large of a lumbar lordosis, or this iliopsoas becomes shortened, it really changes the curvature of your spine and can have a major impact on back disorders. Okay, just showing the iliacus. Here's your quadratus lumborum. You see that it has insertions onto the transverse process of your lumbar spine. So again, impact on lumbar disorders. Okay, so deep to the muscles of the anterolateral wall is fascia, right, our favorite stuff. Variable amount of fat and the parietal peritoneum, right? So we talked about uh, peritoneum in the thoracic cavity as well. You have visceral and uh, pleural. Peritoneum. So here you have your parietal peritoneum, transver uh, transparent membrane that lines the internal surface of the abdominal wall. Within that parietal peritoneum are several umbilical folds, which are remnants from fetal development. And the significance of these folds, not terribly for, for us as therapists, but they do have a significance in that it's where you tend to develop hernias. Right, so you have several of them here. Here is your umbilical fold. This is the median umbilical fold, the medial umbilical fold, and then you have your lateral umbilical fold. So this is where you can develop a hernia, um, but honestly most of the ones you hear is inguinal hernia. So this is not a big factor that we end up treating a whole lot. Okay, so the peritoneum is a glistening transparent serous membrane that consists of two continuous layers, right? So same thing as that we talked about in the thoracic cavity or in the pleural layers. You have your parietal peritoneum, which lines the internal surface of the abdominal pelvic wall, so it's the big outer envelope. And then you have your visceral peritoneum, which invests the organs. So if you picture it, the big balloon on the outside is your parietal peritoneum. And then around each uh, visceral structure in the peritoneum, you have this visceral peritoneum, an envelope around each organ, per se. Okay, so here you go. We have your parietal peritoneum, right? It's all this running outside the entire abdominal cavity, right? And then you have your visceral peritoneum that surrounds each structure. So here's one going around your kidney. You've got your uh, visceral peritoneum going around your stomach and your, um, your intestine. Okay, so the parietal peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum surrounds the organs, the visceral organs within the parietal peritoneum. Peritoneal cavity is the potential space that exists between the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum. Okay, it's mostly composed of water, electrolytes, and other substances, and it too, just as in the pleural cavity, serves as a lubricant. Um, you know, so you have some movement of your viscera within the peritoneal cavity. 
Okay, and here's what we really want to know as therapists, because this is where we will intervene and we use this to screen for disorders. You can divide the um, abdomen into four quarters, a right upper quarter, a left upper quarter, a right lower quarter, and a left lower quarter, or quadrant. Here's quarter quadrant, we'll, we'll live with either one. Okay, and then this tells you exactly what's in each of them. So in this right upper quadrant, you're going to find the pylorus, the duodenum, liver, right kidney, hepatic flexor, the colon, and head of the pancreas. So if you are suggesting, um, or you're working with a patient who is in the hospital and has pancreatic issues, it is this right upper quadrant that you would palpate. If someone is coming to you with low back pain and you are wondering if it could be a kidney issue, then you should palpate in the right and left upper quadrants, right for the right kidney, left for the left. If you're wondering if someone's having appendicitis, right lower quadrant. Okay, so what I want you to get out of this, and this is what you're going to do in lab and what you're going to draw on your t-shirts, is you're going to draw these four quadrants on the t-shirts, and then you're going to draw the structures that are in each one. Because later in the curriculum, we're going to teach you how to screen for back problems that are caused by kidney versus musculoskeletal or disc injuries. So you need to know where, where would you find those kidneys. Same thing for liver and um, the diaphragm and your pancreas and your... And your uh, appendix, right? So we want you to be able to recognize when it's one of these visceral structures causing low back, hip, or leg pain, or chest pain, and it's not a musculoskeletal issue. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of the abdominal viscera, some of the things that are in here, and they are the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines, the spleen, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, kidneys, and suprarenal glands. What I want you to know for each organ is its major function. What does it do? It's major anatomical features, and I'll point out what those are so that you don't get into too great a detail. And for some of them, I am going to want you to know their arterial supply as well, because it's important. Esophagus, tubular conveyor of food from the pharynx to the stomach. What I want you to know is that it passes through the diaphragm at the level of T10, enters the stomach at the cardiac orifice at T11. Okay? Um, the, or the orifice is controlled by a sphincter, which controls entrance of food into the stomach. So it should be closed unless food is ready to enter the stomach to keep uh, stomach acid from entering the esophagus. This is often called reflux. When it's happening, it is happening at the sphincter sometimes. Stomach, major part of the digestive tract, right? Specialized for accumulation of ingested food, where it mechanically and chemically prepares it for digestion. And you have gastric juices in there that um, gradually convert food into a semi-liquid mixture called chyme. Okay, you do need to know these four parts of the stomach, the cardiac region, first part of the stomach where the esophagus enters, usually found around the level of T10. Okay, so if you are suggesting or considering a reflux issue, if you palpate around T10 and you reproduce your patient's symptoms, then you have to consider reflux as a possible cause for their pain. You have the fundus, superior part of the stomach that extends to the left dome of the diaphragm. The body is the main part of the stomach and the pyloric region where it joins the small intestine. Okay, so here you go. Here's your cardiac part of the stomach, your main body, the pyloric part of the stomach as well. Okay, so the main thing you need to know is this um, cardiac notch. So that and know that it's around T10, so that you can palpate that. Stomach is covered by peritoneum, and it's also covered by an omentum, right? So I already mentioned the omentum. There's a greater and a lesser. Um, the greater omentum extends superior and lateral to the left, and inferiorly from the greater curvature of the stomach, connecting the stomach to the diaphragm, spleen, and large intestine. The lesser omentum connects the lesser curvature of the stomach and first part of the small intestine to the liver. Okay, and you'll see these omentum on the cadavers, hopefully. Okay, here's your bigger, greater omentum. Again, and honestly, the ones I've seen are not this see-through. It's a big, full fascial sheath. Okay, but you can see it attaching to the stomach and down through the intestine. Arterial supply to the stomach through left and right gastric arteries. Okay, left and left gastric artery comes off the celiac trunk of the abdominal aorta. Well, the right gastric artery is a branch of the common hepatic artery, which also is a branch of the celiac trunk. 
You have your small intestine, consists of the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. It extends from the pyloric sphincter to the ileocecal junction, which is where the ileum joins the first part of the large intestine called the cecum. It looks like a big balloon in the cecum. The job of the small intestine is to absorb nutrients from the food that we eat. Okay, and here is your small intestine, ileum and the jejunum. Part, right, this is the big sausage thing that we see. Uh, okay, the duodenum is first and shortest part of the small intestine. It has four parts, a superior, a descending part. Um, I am not going to be terribly concerned with you knowing these four parts of the duodenum. Yeah, okay. So here, but here they are. Superior, descending, horizontal, and the, um, I don't even know. Not even the common stem, posterior, inferior, and anterior pancreatic duodenal arteries. No. Don't need to know the parts of this. Jejunum and ileum. The walls of jejunum are much thicker and heavier than those of the ileum. Most of the jejunum lies in the upper left quadrant. While most of the ileum lies in the lower right quadrant, so that you will need to know. A fan-shaped fold of peritoneum called the mesentery attaches the jejunum and the ileum to the posterior abdominal wall. The mesentery is not palpable from outside. And here is your jejunum and your ileum. The superior mesenteric artery supplies the superior part of the jejunum and ileum as well as the mesentery. Once it enters the mesentery, it splits off into 15 to 18 branches. And no, you do not need to know the names of them. Uh, distal part of the jejunum and ileum is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Your large intestine. This is the site where water is absorbed from indigestible residues of liquid chyme, converts it to feces, and temporarily stores it until you're ready to defecate. Large intestine consists of the cecum, the appendix, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, the rectum and the anal canal. Okay, so here you go. Here is your ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid, and then into your rectum and your anal sphincters. Okay, so I mean the names are kind of obvious. Ascend, transverse, descend, and the sigmoid. Sigmoid is sort of S-shape. S that gives you the sigmoid. Okay, um, so those, I do want you to know the parts, and I do want you to know the cecum. Okay, you'll see this on the cadavers. This looks like a balloon. It's kind of funny looking. Uh, the ileum of the small intestine joins the large intestine at the cecum. Okay, so that's when it starts, and the appendix rises from the posterior medial aspect of the cecum, inferior to the ileocecal junction. Colon is described with four parts we just talked about, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. Right, they're named by their shape and where they are. Ascending colon is the second part of the large intestine, passes superior on the right side of the abdominal cavity, from the cecum to the right lobe of the liver. And that's where it turns to the left at the right colic or hepatic flexure. So colic and hepatic, same thing. Flexure means turn, so it's the left turn. Blood supplies through the inferior mesenteric artery. Okay, and here's just, you know, so we just talked about this ascending. This would be your hepatic flexure, the actual turn. Your spleen is located in the left upper abdominal quadrant between ribs 9 through 11. So, that I want you to know. Nine, ribs 9 through 11, that's where your spleen would be. Largest lymphatic organ in the body assists in defense against infection as a site of white blood cell proliferation and as a graveyard for red blood cells. Varies considerably in size, weight, and shape, but is usually about 12 centimeters long and 7 centimeters wide. So that's quite large. Okay, and here is your spleen, just sitting under your diaphragm. Your pancreas, elongated accessory digestive gland, travels transversely across the posterior abdominal wall, posterior to the stomach, right between the duodenum on the right and the spleen on the left. It has both endocrine and exocrine functions. The exocrine function, it produces pancreatic juice that enters the duodenum through the main and accessory pancreatic ducts to aid in digestion. Its endocrine function is to produce glucagon and insulin that release and store sugar into the bloodstream. 
okay, and here is your pancreas, right, here is your stomach, so it's inferior, the rest of your stomach would be here, so it's inferior to your stomach, running all along here. Um, I, I want you to know that it has a head, neck, body, and tail, but you don't need to identify them on an image. Liver is the largest single organ in the body. It weighs approximately 1,500 grams. It counts for 2.5% of an adult's body weight. That's a lot for a single organ. Except for fat, all nutrients absorbed from the GI tract are cleansed by the liver through the portal circulation and also produces bile and stores glucagon. Liver has two surfaces, the diaphragmatic and the visceral. Right, diaphragmatic, oops, right here, and your visceral. Uh, it has a falciform ligament that attaches the diaphragmatic surface of the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. Okay, so pretty much you can think of this almost like a tendon. You know, it's attaching the organ itself to the anterior abdominal wall. Kidneys, ureters, and suprarenal glands. Kidneys produce urine, right, and it's conveyed to the ureters to the urinary bladder. On the supraromedial aspect of each kidney is a suprarenal gland, and these glands are endocrine organs which produce corticosteroids, androgens, and catecholamines, such as epinephrine, and function completely separate of the kidneys. Kidneys line the posterior abdominal wall, one on each side of the vertebrae column, vertebral column, from T12 to L3. So I want you to know that because I want you to be able to find the kidneys when you go to palpate them. The concave medial side of each kidney is the hilum, which is the site where the renal artery and veins enter and leave. And blood supply is from the renal arteries. Okay, your abdominal aorta. It's a continuation of the thoracic aorta, which we saw in the, in the thorax, right? Um, and is now below the diaphragm. It runs along the posterior abdominal wall. It has several branches, including the inferior phrenic arteries that go to the diaphragm and the esophagus superior, middle, and inferior suprarenal arteries that go to the suprarenal glands. Your celiac trunk, which has three major vessels coming off of it, the common hepatic to the liver, the left gastric artery to the stomach, the splenic artery to the spleen and pancreas. Then you have left and right renal arteries that go to your kidneys, the superior mesenteric artery to the superior half of the small intestine, the mesentery to the small intestine. Gonadal arteries, testicular males and ovarian and females go to the testes or the ovaries. Inferior mesenteric artery, the inferior half of the small intestine, all of the large intestine. The lumbar arteries go to the posterior abdominal wall and the pelvic region. Those are all branches off of your abdominal aorta. Okay, and here they all are. This image will show you. I'm going to look for a cleaner image um, for you to learn these from. That image is kind of a mess. Uh, abdominal aorta ends as it bifurcates into the common iliac arteries, and these arteries move toward the pelvic cavity and quickly divide into internal and external branches. The internal are going to supply a large part of the pelvis, including the bladder, fallopian tubes, ureters, and the urethra. And the external runs more superficially and crosses the hip joint to become the big old femoral artery. Whoops. Oh dear, sorry. You make me nauseous. Okay. Oh, that was the end lecture. Well, that made it easy. Okay, so that is your abdomen lecture. Uh, we will do this in lab, obviously, and we'll see what we find in the cadavers.